Hey, what's going on? What's the good word? Well, I wasn't planning this, but I figured why not? It's been a while since I had a solo stream. I decided to take a break, talk about a bunch of stuff. But uh, yeah, you know, I want to talk about. Actually, hold on a second. Dun, 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 dun. Can y'all still hear me? Yo, Black Outcast Media, how's it going? You feeling okay, man? Young Stokely, what's going on? Damn, y'all, a lot of y'all around for middle of the afternoon. That's good. Um, I will talk about like a bunch of random stuff I thought was kind of funny. Um, some of this stuff is old, but I just never remembered to talk about it. Uh, this is something that was happened that was funny back in uh, July. Hold on. Imagine whatever mistakes we've all made, right? So if we look at the Commonwealth, and I know part of the conversation we're going to explore later on is looking at the history. But I have this theory lately, man. People always talk about how um, dumb the Republicans have become, like the right have become pretty dumb like the idea of the intellectual conservative that was they were trying to make a thing back in the day with national review and william buckley and thomas sowell like those days are gone it's out the window and that's true but i think what people aren't realizing is everybody's dumber like it's it's kind of like if iron sharpens iron you know the increasing dumbness of the right is being corresponded by a lot of people on the left a lot of liberals getting dumber too like this is hands down the dumbest class of liberals and academics and black radicals and even leftists you know um because a lot of people think leftists are immune because they read so much theory like they're probably the most theory intensive reading uh, people but it's like you look at how seriously that um there's this australian lady in the left that is just spouting gibberish all day and people treat her like a serious thinker she would not have been taken seriously i think in any other type of era and she's has these serious stands that act like she's just dropping knowledge it's and even the fact that you have to spend time debunking her is just still a sad statement of things and um i think in some ways it's even trickier for the left and for um a lot of radicals of all races because I think it's easier for those people like like black radicals who do a lot of um the reading or leftists because they're so much smarter than everyone else that it's almost harder to see how much intellectual decline has happened in their circles because uh, as humans we tend to use contrast to kind of judge things right so if if you have like the dumbest conservatives and the dumbest liberals um in recent living history as what you have to contrast yourself against then you know you're gonna seem so much smarter than them it's gonna be really easy to kind of stop feeling yourself you know because that's not a hard group to be smarter than, you know? So it's like, um, so it's like, I think it's even, even easier for us. Cause like these liberals talking about Harry Potter all day and comparing everything to Harry Potter and saying dumb, all types of dumb things. Like I'm going to give you, I'm going to give an example, right? I'm going to give, I'm going to give you an example. Of like things that people like with degrees and tenure and all this stuff will say and it's like 
or supposed activists and people listen to and then you think to yourself like this is a pretty basic like this is this is this is one thing right check check this out Um, this woman's some kind of activist or something. Um, so everybody's just doing this thing, blaming black men. Jamel Hill, um, this lady Seal, Seal Lie Abrams. I'm not exactly sure what her um, deal is, but uh, she was a model at some point. I think now she is a writer and an activist and and a thinker and. She wrote, she wrote this to quote um, Jamel Hill. So she goes, Jamel Hill says, I have increasingly found that many black men just want better access to patriarchy. They don't actually want it dismantled. Like Jamel Hill, who's worked for nothing but major corporations led by rich white men and covered leagues, you know, owned by rich, rich white men and has climbed her way to, um, you know, the corporate ladder, you know, but somehow just being there as a woman is her dismantling uh, patriarchy as opposed to just wanting better access to it. So I don't see why, you know, black men just can't use representation and count themselves as dismantling patriarchy just by partaking in it as well. If you're going to use that dumb logic, you know, like, I don't know what serious anti-patriarchal moves she has ever done. I started asking for a job from the patriarchy, but you know, whatever. Um, so this lady, Seal Lie Abrams, this lady, Seal Lie Abrams, um, puts black men already have access to patriarchy. We live in a patriarchal society, and, you know, they can never tell us what access to patriarchy we supposedly have. But she goes, What black men want is the ability to weaponize their patriarchal privilege. And again, she doesn't explain what patriarchal privilege, um, black men have without any consequences the way white men can okay if you can't exercise your patriarchal the so-called privilege without consequences then it's not patriarchal privilege you know what i'm saying that's like that's like saying um black people have racial privilege they're just mad they can't get um any freedom from consequences due to the racial privilege like it makes no sense you know it's like saying it's like saying um you know you have a lot of wealth you're just mad that you don't have any uh money with which to express the wealth like or property it's it's it makes no sense like it's and i always call these type of tweets 1000 like tweets like you, know, you just tweet it 1000 likes 1000 likes so this thing is 3000 likes 1000 retweets for this freaking nonsense. It makes no makes no sense. She basically says that black men can't weaponize uh being a man without getting consequences, which how is how is it then patriarchal privilege? Like like think about it. It's not this is not me being some kind of brain genius and, you know, dissecting some really nuanced thing and and catching her. Like this is just me using common sense it's it, it's not it's not that i'm super smart here this is just a really dumb tweet like like it's self-contradicting it's so and um like the fact that this thing had a thousand like uh two thousand likes which is so so utterly ridiculous to me uh i feel like uh the movie idiocracy is happening in our lifetimes like you don't even have to go into Suspended animation and wake up like a thousand years later. You could just like uh like like in, in idiocracy, somebody went to an average guy went to suspended animation, and then people got so much dumber that when he came out of suspended animation, he was now the smartest person alive, and people kind of worshipped him as um as this kind of genius. I mean, the movie Idiocracy has a lot of problems. I think it's a kind of a eugenicist wet dream. It's a, it's politically, it's a weird thing, but I do think the idea of uh, people just getting um, 
more and more ridiculous as far as how the wound to think is a real is a real thing but i i think it's happening in the real in real time like existing people are actually um getting dumber and it's making the people who work alongside them and the people who kind of spar with them um correspondingly get get dumber because no one's keeping each other uh sharp you know it's a it's a mediocrity mafia is what i call it but and to keep up like people are trying to keep up with the dumbness like i think people are trying to like dumb themselves down to stay relevant to stay in the conversation you know um but it gets worse right because because look at this um so first, she basically contradicts herself. She says they have privilege. They just want, you know, to use their privilege without consequences, you, you know, which means if you're getting consequences for your behavior, then it's not an example of privilege. Like just being a man doesn't give you patriarchal privilege if you're not actually able to cash it in for any actual freedom from consequences. Like if they don't have freedom for consequences, then what is the privilege that 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 being a man is giving them that's the whole point of patriarchy is that you don't get consequences right so you know i, I just kind of love that uh idea i mean because it's so cool and trendy to bash black men i think people should kind of check their reasoning at the door but if you were to change things a little they would get it so if you kind of said hey uh black women have a lot of uh privileges in ways that they can uh a lot of privileges for being a woman um you know same as white women do any differences um white women have no consequences and get a lot of protection from um the dominant society and black women get nothing for being a woman like like it's if you said something like that, people were like, okay, you're making absolutely no sense. But as soon as people hear, wait, black men being bashed, like, zzz, 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 things just kind of uh, freak out. Uh, like, like, like 1,000 likes, 1,000 likes, 1,000 likes. But, you know, as if that wasn't bad enough, the next tweet, right? This is my favorite uh, thing. And by favorite, I mean, I hate it. But she goes, the responses to my tweet this is what they do they say they tweet stupid things then they uh come back and say you know this backlash i'm getting just proves i'm right you know uh, but when a bunch of simps come in and agree with them that also proves that they're right so when people agree with them that proves they're right when no one says anything that proves they're right and when people push back that proves they're right so i'm not even sure how they can be wrong about anything i don't like I don't really know. I think only if a white person um, threatens to take away a financial opportunity, that's the only way uh, they can ever be wrong about anything. Because that's the only time I ever see these people apologize. But she goes, the responses to my tweet about black men and patriarchy are getting spicy. A hit dog gonna holler, so mute. Now, this is a big pet peeve of mine. Hit dog holler means something like um <laughs> okay when someone says hit dogs holler hit dogs holler means i didn't name you and out of the blue you just come barking rah, 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 like like i called you out and someone says oh it's like a hit dog holler so if i say like uh you know i'm telling you someone's really um someone is is really stinking up the joint half the time you know with their stupid opinions and that i don't say anything then john comes and goes well you know say call me out by name you know just just call me out and it's like yo john like nobody said said you like why are you uh acting like that i was talking about something else but if I say, you know, so then I could say, oh, hit dogs holler. John, you know, really seems to feel kind of guilty, you know, or, or if I say, um, yeah, I think somebody has been stealing from the company um, 10 for like a while. And you have like 1000 employees at the company. And then 
um, John comes out and says, just accuse me, okay? You know, and th- just call me out by name. And it's like, wait, John, there's a thousand people here. Why do you think we're talking about you? Uh, that's, that's, yo, John, I think, I think you're, uh, I think you're a hit dog hollering. But if I say, yo, John is stealing from the tin, and then John goes, why are you accusing me? And I say, oh, hit dog holler, John. Why are you acting like I'm, accu- I'm accusing you? Like, it doesn't work. It, it, makes, it makes no sense. Like, uh, hey, um, hey, hey, Joe, uh, you're really the stupidest person at this company. And Joe's like, hey, why are you calling me stupid for? Like, like uh, I've proven X, Y, and Z that, you know, I've read the for the company. Oh, Joe, why are you getting defensive? Like, you know, hit dog hollering, you know, like, like, it's, so like, if you call out black men and then black men respond, that's not hit dog hollering. Like who else is going to respond to it? Like, it, like, it's really, it's really stupid. Like, like, and I looked through the replies and, and, but see, this is the thing. It wasn't just, um, like-minded people who weren't challenging it. There were a bunch of black men that replies like, well, you know, black men actually do this, black men. And I was like, nobody noticed that the hit dog hollering thing is is, is stupid. And it's like, I feel like the opposition gets like uh, lesson two because everyone just jumped right into the argument and was just like, uh, well, actually black men, black men. And, and to me, the first thing should have been to kind of make fun of just a that she basically admitted that black men have no patriarchal privilege. You know that her proof of their patriarchal privilege was accidentally admitting that they that they actually don't have any. And then B, she doesn't even understand what a uh, hit dogs hollering even means, right? So it um. Yeah, yeah. So, so I just find it uh, funny how fundamentally unserious a lot of these people are. But she's got blue check. She's got um, a platform. She is her thing. She's seen on here's her bio: author of Black Lotus. So she's a book author, radical black feminist, uh, Bryn Mawr McBride scholar, seen on CNN, MSNBC, People Magazine. NPR and more. Um, cancer, sun slash Scorpio moon, she slash her. So basically, she gets to be a talking head and author and an expert on things. And she can't even under- understand how not to make a self contradicting argument um, and how the hit dog holler thing actually, actually works. And but like I said, her opponents in the thread weren't much better either. They were, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's a bit, it's a bit much. Um, I don't know what this means. It, does it mean like too like physically smooth? Because I shave. You know, you say you can't trust a black man with no facial hair, and I shaved off um, everything. So I don't know if this is what he, <laughs> the Daniel Miller's, uh, referring to i'm too i'm too uh smooth now like maybe i'm gonna start um selling out yeah yeah maybe i feel i feel a craving for like butter biscuits like since i shaved off uh everything you know i don't know you know someone said that's why she's a blue check a collaborator of uh racism white supremacy on the low see but that's not even the point to me because i've always been collaborators of racist white supremacy but I mean, this used to be smarter. Like, um, like compare like a Thomas Sowell or a Stanley Crouch or a Larry Elder to like the kind of childish things uh, that she's talking about. Like, oh, black men have a lot of patriarchal privilege. You know, they're just mad that they can't actually use it to get any uh, patriarchal privilege uh, and no freedom from consequences. The you know, and then uh, oh, people are responding to me calling out black men by, you know, uh, a lot of black men are responding to that. That seems like hit dogs hollering, you know, like, yeah, they were, uh, 
Yeah, I mean that's that's the thing. They've they've always had these motivations. They've always had these agendas, but it's like um I mean like you have like uh leftists arguing all day like about about um whether charcuterie is is bourgeois or not. That was an argument I saw. There was um people spending a whole day trying to analyze the backyard of the people who are gonna kidnap that woman government Whitmer, you know, because if they could prove that the backyard was a poor person's backyard, then that was gonna prove something about class versus race. And I was like, you know, this is kind of like a silly argument. Like, you know, this is not very high level Marxist discourse, but I mean, compared to everything else, this is just high level analysis, you know? And I think that's kind of what's uh, getting scarier. Like everybody's getting kind of uh, pulled down, you know? Yeah, so yeah, John, John McHorder. Yeah, I mean, John McHorder can make plausible arguments, you know? Yeah. <laughs> ah, that's too funny. Yeah, you know, I just got tired of trying to shape up the beard and trying to do the hairline and everything. I just got, I don't want to go into the barber, but I don't want to actually uh, keep doing all that stuff, so. I threw in the towel. This is me admitting defeat. Yeah, but that was just something that really bothered me. I, I like, I just like, I'm just really worried because I just feel like nobody's keeping each other sharp anymore. I mean, people are doing articles for the New York Times that are just like, I feel like 20 years ago, wouldn't have even, uh, made into entertainment weekly it's it's here's the thing it's not funny it's not actually related to um anything yeah someone said a race to the bottom um look at this one this one's funny uh prince harry came on this is a perfect example of no one questioning stuff right prince harry came on and they had all these uh, black people, and I didn't check their bios, well, but I got a feeling what the bios were like, right? So they're there talking with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Uh, they got that kind of Negro whisperer vibe where they uh, love talking privilege with white people who are, who are privileged and, you know, kind of help the white person look woke by being seen with black people and listening to like their pain and performatively uh ally themselves so i didn't see this whole thing it was over at the hill and I, i'm like why are these four black people talking to prince harry and Meghan markle about stuff like why did they bring them out um but <laughs> prince harry goes when it comes to institutional and systemic racism it's there and it stays there because someone somewhere is benefiting from it. So um, check check this out. Let me know if you can hear it well. A lot of it as well is in that self-reflection, it's acknowledging whatever mistake. Is the audio playing? I don't know if you can hear it. I stopped being able to hear it. Can you guys still hear it? Yeah, I think it cut out. Hold on. A lot of it as well is in that self-reflection, it's, it's acknowledging whatever mistakes we've all made, right? So if we look at the Commonwealth, and I know part of the conversation we're going to explore later on is looking at the history of that. But if you start on that macro level, you also have to look on a more micro level with each of us as individually. What have we done in our past that we put our hand up? And I think this is a moment of reckoning where so many people go, you know what, I need to own that. Maybe I didn't do the right thing there. I knew what I knew. 
However, now it's time to reset in a different way. And I think both of us, it's part of the conversation we've had quite a bit in our, in our calls over the last few weeks surrounding the Black Lives Matter movement for everyone to be a part of this conversation. And when it comes to sort of institutional and systemic racism, it's there and it stays there because someone somewhere is benefiting from it. We can't deny or... Okay, this is the part I like. Someone somewhere is benefiting from white supremacy and white privilege says the prince who inherited riches and an empire from an institution called monarchy that is pretty much the purest embodiment of uh, privilege and imperialism that um, there is. Oh, is it echoed y'all? You know what? I know what the problem is there. I can get rid of the echo. I know exactly what that is. So it won't be echoed going forward, I think. Um, yeah, so I just like that there's having these big, useless platitudes. Um, and I'm thinking, is anybody going to point out that, uh, you know, this guy, like, this guy just read um, Tumblr 101 and like, what's the point of even having four black people to hold his feet to the fire if this is just <laughs> what they're going to do? They're just uh, cheer cheerleaders. Well, Ignore the fact that all of us have been brought up and educated to see the world differently. He makes it sound like he's just a regular white guy in the ground, uh, just like a regular coal miner or something, or some middle class uh, white guy. You're a freaking prince of a of the monarchy not just a monarchy but like the monarchy when it comes to uh world domination you know there was a time when you guys they said the sun doesn't set on the british empire which meant that at any given time of day the sun was shining on something that britain held you know and you guys are still spending that money you know your coffers are still lined with it you're not just sharing general white complicity here you know however once you start to realize that there is that bias there then you need to acknowledge it you need to acknowledge so, so, so basically uh the big solution to his uh hundreds thousands year year of um monarchy and privilege is implicit bias training and you know um reading audrey lord or something like it's 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 totally it's totally ridiculous um that's that's just hilarious to me but then you need to do the work to be able to do the work so he he's gonna read uh robin d'angelo white fragility uh that, that's I'm the work he's gonna do so that you yeah, can, exactly what you're saying and i think so much of what we're seeing and you like see the guy like nodding and stuff like like i said they're just there to just kind of be um um, absolvers, you know, like just dare to nod and whatever. As well as that, you know, it's not even in the big moments, right? It's in the quiet moments where racism and unconscious bias lies, and mm -hmm. as you've said, lies and hides lies. and thrives. And it's those the nuances that I think is makes it confusing for a lot of people to understand the role that they play in that, either passively or actively, but I think even more so passively. And so much of what I've come to the understanding of, especially in learning even more about it of late, and obviously having had personal experience with it as well, but in people- Okay, and it's like, okay, what is the big thing that you did that makes you such an authority on this? Like, what have you, what have you done? Like, you married into like the biggest symbol of privilege and imperialism still standing, you know, and what? Cause you read a couple of, um, uh, diversity and, um, whatever they call it, you know, the, the diversity training materials, like, uh, and you have some implicit bias talk and, some Robin D'Angelo style talk and some um, self awareness talk, like that counters that, you know? It's, um, I mean, this guy dressed up as a Nazi as a Halloween costume. Like, come on, come, come on. Like, um, 
I don't know. It, it, it's like you you married into this. I don't really see. And the fact that he says someone is benefiting. Gee, I wonder who's benefiting our king, a prince, you know? People's complacency, they're complicit. Yeah. And that, I think- Talk about being complicit when you're marrying into like um, institutions so racist that not only did it drive you back home, but it actually drove their own son out. Um, like it's, it's, it's so racist. He got driven out just for being associated with you and you're like, um, can basically pass for white. I think it's the shift that we're saying to go, it's not enough to just be a bystander and saying, well, it wasn't me. And that's why are they not lecturing her and him? Why are they acting like they're being educated by them? Like these four people are just unambiguously black. And they're supposed to be writers and intellectuals and whatever. They should be lecturing them. Why are they nodding and approving and giving this kind of, you know, like, um, this is an ass backwards world. He should be asking them, um, what needs to be done. And they should be having a million things. They shouldn't just be, silently um co-signing this this absurdist theater it's the most absurdist thing this is the fact that people think this is normal you know and a lot of people were like cheering they were like man prince harry gets invited to the cookout you know uh he's aware of his privilege he's doing it. and it's like the black black people were saying this it's the most ridiculous thing i've ever seen what I think was very much manifested in, in what you're feeling. People's- I wonder what's going on in their heads. I wonder if any of them are just like thinking, man, it's really worth it. Like, like I, I hope there's, there's something in their head that is, um, you know, thinking, oh, this is really, I hope that check clears. This is really worth it, you know? And then uh, this guy, Dan Brooks, tweeted, he said, someone somewhere is benefiting from this, said the prince, <laughs> which I thought that was pretty funny but yeah i mean uh, so something else i saw that was really ridiculous um <laughs> someone that i think his name is i don't know how to pronounce it, i think it's called jim he's a uh, follower of the show, and he, and he sent this. I stopped watching Lovecraft Country because I just thought the show was just too ridiculous, and I couldn't take it anymore. And they had this episode about Emmett Till where they made it about black girl magic. Like they used Emmett Till to um, explore all their pet um, obsessions, you know, um, race play type of relationships uh white allies white women black girl magic you know they they made it about everything except emmett till and they kind of erased emmett till from his own his own story and and made it about a little girl and about a white woman and about a a black woman trying to make her white lover understand um her blackness those those are what they used uh Emma Till's story to discuss not systemic racism not um black unity nothing you know so i stopped watching it but someone sent me this and i didn't uh see the episode myself uh cuz yeah it's just not a it's just a show but uh check check this out and this is what i mean this is another example of just how um not bright these people are to me so check this out they have two african-american studies professors from yale they have a bunch of show writers college educated a lot of them are experienced for doing a lot of writing and they had they put this in there i don't know if y'all can see it but they have this headline for in the latest episode apparently and the headline says um, all white all male jury acquits Emmett Till's murder murderers and 
it was a uh, says Chicago Defender and Jinkazi um wrote was this a real headline cuz cuz it um you know seems like it, they wouldn't say that back then and i looked at it and i'm like you know this seems like very much like presentism but it can't be can it cuz is it really that hard to find a real headline like why would they make up a headline it takes in this day of the internet and some of these people are actual academics so not just um journalists or writers they should be able to really have the access through their institutions and whatever to get access to the real chicago defender headlines for people who don't know chicago defender is a black um newspaper that was very prestigious and uh, you know well known especially back in the day so I put it on Twitter. I said, you know, let me put it on Twitter because I have a lot of followers and a lot of them are like pretty smart people because I was Googling and I couldn't find this headline. And, um, you know, I put it up there and nobody uh, could find it. But I'm sure you guys realize the problem with this thing, right? It says all white, all male jury acquits Emmett Till's murders. Now, this is like intersectional presentism. They're trying to put intersectional thinking into the past. And these people cannot think outside of themselves or they don't want to because, like, I watched the movie A Soldier Story um, about two weeks ago for the Champagne Sharks uh, m- movie discussion club. You can listen to the discussion over at patreon.com forward slash champagne sharks. Uh, it's one of the new perks that we have. We have a book club and a movie discussion club. And if you're a patron, uh, $5 a month, 16 cents a day, um, you're able to join into these movie discussions and these book club discussions with us. And then we all um, discuss it after we read a chapter of the book or after we watch um, the movie. Now, and we record it too, so people can listen to the old discussions. If you want to hear the discussion we had about the movie Soldier Story, you can go over to patreon.com forward slash champagne sharks and become a member and listen. But when we watched Soldier Story, what was really interesting to me is they didn't touch on any real big life things. They didn't like say, hey, remember Emmett Till? Or remember this um, iconic civil rights thing? Like they didn't do this Forrest Gumpization of the civil rights movement uh, throughout it. What they did was they just told the intimate interpersonal story and all the emotion and all the uh, trauma and all the ups and downs, they were forced to earn within the limits of script screenplay or the film or the two hours. Like they introduced everybody. They, properly characterized everybody they characterized their interactions with each other and by the time you were done any emotions that you had that were generated that uh, felt were all earned they didn't tap into anything um any flashpoint events that were pre-existing um to generate that emotion but what's also interesting is even though it was technically about a core group of people's interpersonal dealings. When it was all said and done, they ended up making statements and commentaries about the world outside and black people's struggles outside and historic struggles that we've had, you know, things like, um, classism, colorism, um, Oh, Jim Kaz is in here. He said that he got it from, Gamby Man 8 on Twitter. So uh, props to him. Props to him too. Yeah, that's exactly the reference. <laughs> that's exactly what I was doing. Uh, yeah, so all that. Um, so it depicts people doing interpersonal stuff to um, comment on big societal historical things. And it earns all of its um, emotions and gut punches and everything through the work on the page. But these modern writers, you know, um, they do it the other way around. They take big 
flashpoint events that people have pre-existing emotional connection to. And it, instead of taking like small things and using the small things, like Fences is an example. Fences is about, you know, a father, his wife, and his son. And with all the stuff they explore through those three people and all the emotions that they earn, you know, August Wilson has bigger systemic and historical roots that you can, you know, then extrapolate, right? What these people do is they take big things that people already have emotional connection to, like huge flashpoint events, like, you know, uh, the Emmett Till thing, the Tulsa, Oklahoma thing, things that are uh, gross miscarriages of justice that just fire people up just hearing about it or they already know about and are upset about. And then use the big stuff to talk about minor little interpersonal nonsense. They trivialize the systemic to discuss interpersonal hangups rather than take explore seemingly trivial interpersonal hangups to make deeper insights about the systemic right and this is going to come back to this headline i'm just i'm just um give me some background about where i'm going right so think about this for a second uh they take emmett till and this thing that arguably sparked the whole civil rights movement to begin with and inflamed a nation and set in motion a bunch of dominoes that led to some of our greatest civil rights um, advancements. They took that major thing that people are very emotional about. That picture of Emmett Till is still traumatizing to this day. And most people who have studied black history and known it. And what do they use it to talk about? They talk about just usual slave play shit, you know, stuff about uh, how do you um, get in a relationship with a rich white person and get them to understand, um, you know, and educate them about issues. Like, okay, that's what you can use uh, Emmett Till for. Like, you can use Emmett Till to, uh, but for you, these are your problems. And you can't think outside your lifestyle, interpersonal bougie bullshit problems you know uh the girl who wrote the uh episode they take emmett till right and they use it to talk about this character d who's barely been in the show and has been super underdeveloped right what they do is because they don't have the skill to actually like august wilson or um the right or charles fuller who wrote a, a soldier story they don't have the ability to make you genuinely care and feel for a three-dimensional character just off the strength of their pen what they do instead is they take Emmett Till who people do have um emotional connection whatever for and then they pull this trick it's almost like neuro neurolinguistic programming or or um someone says it's like pickup artistry, you know, where they kind of trick you into having an association. They start off with Emmett Till and his funeral and then switch to the underdeveloped character D and that feeling and connection and trauma and emotion that you feel for Emmett Till, you now unconsciously start feeling for D, but it's totally unearned. That character has done like nothing and they don't really flesh her out at all. They basically just piggyback off of um, this dead black man to as a shortcut or a cheat to um, make up for their deficiencies in writing and characterization. And what did they use D for? The writer posted on Instagram. Uh, let's see if I can actually find it. Uh, I think I'll do better if I actually... Um, find it right but um because i think you have to really see it i want to capture it um correctly but the writer was a nigerian girl named ihuoma or and i'm gonna find her instagram post because she did an instagram post about this about this um episode and
I'm gonna find her her Instagram. I should have had it ready, but it just crossed my mind to even do this. Her name is Ihuoma Ofodire. She was also busted for um, saying disparaging things about um, African Americans and calling them um, Akatas, which was kind of messed up. Uh, I know she has an Instagram, but I cannot find it. Give me a second. Oh, something uh, sporters for people who care about that stuff. I'm telling you right now, but uh, they they ended the season um, killing the straight black man. <laughs> they they uh, which didn't happen in the book. They uh, and on the, and on the official podcast for the show, the writers basically said that they kind of hated that they got uh stuck with him like they inherited him from the um uh, they inherited him from the novel uh and that they were kind of uncomfortable having to um you know deal with them but they got around it by um killing him so now there's only um the black women and the gay black and the gay black man uh left so uh good for them i guess you know the nightmare of having to pretend to empathize with him is uh, no longer necessary. So it's good for them. I'm having trouble finding her, her Instagram, unfortunately. But what I wanted to show was how she characterized, how she characterized um, the episode, you know, and her and her writing of it. She said. Uh, I'm not going to do it justice. I really have to find the... Uh, forget it. Anyway, what she said was that um, she was glad to um, work on this episode and she got a chance to show uh, Black Girl Magic and how she empathized growing up being a Black girl, having no one listen, no one listen to them, you know, you know and no one ever listened to her as a black girl growing up and this was a chance through the character of b to um to express that and have someone someone listen to her and i'm like okay that's not what emma tills about like you don't think something as big as emma till and use that big thing and the emotions from it to generate sympathy for your own personal youth hangups you know as an artist what you should be doing is using your own personal things and whatever to transport people if it's supposed to be a piece of political art to bigger issues you know you're not supposed to trivialize big issues down into your like teenage journal bullshit you're supposed to be taking your um childhood stuff and as an adult find a way to kind of tie it into something bigger and longer lasting and fundamental you know um let me check what people have been talking about in the comments because i haven't been able to um oh yeah so jinx called it right nlp anchoring that's exactly what they're doing they're doing anchoring Anchoring, thank you for the work. I knew it was in your linguistic programming, but yeah, anchoring is when you take, you c call up some existing emotion and then you, um, I think it's called priming. You prime the person with something else and you try to get them to transfer that existing emotion they have. So like a pickup artist who studied NLP, they would try to get like a woman talking about something that like attracted her or excited her and then try to trick the woman into associating it into the conversation with you. And the idea was that now the woman um, would start associating that emotion, whether it's connection or lust, um, with you, but you didn't actually earn it. It's like a hypnotic trick. And 
And um, that's what these people kind of do with their uh, writing. Like slave play was like that. Slave play tries to use slavery and uh, the intergenerational trauma of that to uh, kind of get you into this person's personal hang up about how why can't the white people I crush on love me the way I want them to love me and why did it make me feel shitty? Like he's using something serious like slavery, something silly like that. And these people do that with everything that they do. And they can't think about anything bigger than themselves because they can't connect with anything bigger than themselves. And they also just are really incurious. They don't really give a fuck about anything outside of um, themselves, you know? Um, yeah, I think they are. I think it's a safe thing to say. Uh, for people who want to listen to our podcast, you should definitely listen to our podcast with Jason England. It's the last one that came out. We talk about this. We talk about this a lot, right? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. This this woman is a is a total booster. Well, you no. Know, the thing with these people is, I mean, they give each other jobs, and the borders between different fields is very porous now. The the days when someone was a critic for life, or a journalist for life, or an activist for life, or a screenwriter for life are gone. Now you're just a glorified influencer and you bounce back and forth at, between pseudo activists, pseudo screenwriter, whatever. So like, for example, uh, it's not just a black thing. This is just blue checkism in general. Damon Lindelof, the creator of Watchmen hired about three different, I think three different critics uh, who did recaps for his old shows as TV writers for his new shows. So basically once you do that, right, um, every critic going forward is going to think that way. They're going to be like, wow, if he hired three recappers in the past, then I might actually, if I recap correctly, I might actually get hired by him too. So now becoming a critic becomes like a job application for them. It's a chance to be discovered. You want to get on his radar. So are you going to critique things very critically, you know? And that's probably how this film Fatale Girl you're talking about um, are... Oh, yeah, I forgot. This is nothing. Comic book author, that's also a side hustle. Like Eve Ewing, Roxane Gay, ta Coast, they all jumped into that. Like, But then by becoming a comic book author, they might be called up to work on TV. Like, I think Eve Ewing got called up to work on a Marvel TV show based on... So she used her... She started off as a poet slash activist uh then user activism to petition for um a job at marvel and created her own buzz and she got a bunch of other blue checks i had a previous live stream about that and now she's gonna get to work on a tv show you know so of course this this um of course this film fatale woman who pretends to be a um who pretends to be a film critic or a film whatever like pauline kale far as i know um never was trying to break into movies she was just that was her thing she was just a movie reviewer like those days are gone everybody it's porous it's fluid like yeah people are calling fluid like like, like their their callings are very very fluid it's it can be um be anything um so, um, give me a second. I'm just going to pull up some stuff. I thought of one other way that I might be able to find that Instagram uh, post where she mentions what, in, what went into it. Um, but, yeah, it's just a load. It's just a load of crap. It's, it's a load of crap. Um, but <laughs> looking for the Roger Ebert <laughs> Spider Man screenplay. <laughs> Cisco and Ebert started doing stand up. Hey, that would happen now. Yeah. Yeah, that would totally that would totally happen now. Uh <laughs> someone said speaking of comic books, film fatales friends with that rod guy who said he cried after black panther yeah one of these guys said they cried after 
uh, Black Panther and they finally felt seen, which again is about them. They cannot enjoy anything without making it about them. They can't write anything without making it about them. They can't enjoy anything. Like they could watch um, the most moving rendition of Madame Bovary and then just sit there and struggle and be like, but you know, um, there wasn't enough representation in it. Like, you know, they wouldn't be able to tap into the humanity of it. They would need some way to get some kind of um, come up off of it, something they could tap into to make it about themselves and self-promote. Like, the, I mean, it's got to be a miserable way to live, to not be able to actually enjoy anything outside of the come up you can get off of it, you know? It's got to be a miserable way to live to me. But, um... My favorite is the um Vicente Minnelli version if you want to go by the books. I mean if you want to go by the by the movies. I really love love that um movie cuz back then they were very willing to go abroad with the emotions and I think it really uh, works. There was a newer version um that was trying to be art house and it's like a prestige TV show. There's a lot of dullness and quietness because i think they want to make it seem um arty for lack of a better word and it just ends up being boring it just has all the trappings of a prestige tv show or a modern art house flick and um i didn't really like the new one from a couple of years ago and it was done by a woman so people were celebrating it for that reason like it was going to be a more feminist one and it just ended up being really dull um yeah boredom equals depth that's that's uh yeah res the Vicente uh Minnelli version I think is is really um um powerful but um to bring it back to bring it back to that horrible um let's see if I can find it I think I lost it but I want to bring it back to what we were talking about before, right? This right here. Um, so the headline there is all white, all male jury acquits Emmett Till's murder and and um what Jinkaze and Gambi men spotted that were that was totally on point is why would they even phrase it like that that's a modern intersectional analysis of the thing what black people in the 1950s are hung up on the gender makeup of an all-white jury you know like um and these people think like that a lot. Like, if any of you saw Antebellum with uh, Janelle Monae, um, these white supremacists create a modern-day slavery camp where they reenact um, Antebellum slavery, and they take, um, they kidnap a bunch of like uh, blavity Buzzfeed blacks because apparently those are the most threatening to white supremacy. It's a very uh, self-aggrandizing uh, idea, right? They they take like. Um, Janelle Monet is basically a hotter version of Professor Crunk, and she's like the big target of the white supremacist. She goes on um, the talking head pundit shows and dunks on um, white conservatives and stuff, and that makes her just powerful enough that they have to craft this um, outrageous scheme. So um, they some some white woman befriends tries to befriend her and tricks her and kidnaps her and brings her to this plantation this modern plantation that's made to reenact slavery times where she's like given a new name um uh, beaten down and traumatized and raped and everything and uh Jeanne Monet breaks free and starts to make her way back to the final um uh, the, the final word on uh, world, you know, the real world. Well, the first thing that happens is the straight black man can't protect her. Right. So, so first 
<laughs> the straight black man is like impotent. He tries to protect her and he just gets waxed by some fat middle aged white guy. You know, as a total punk. He's like has a bunch of muscles and is young, has been working back breaking slave work for the past couple of months. But uh, he gets wiped out instantly. So he's just there for um, to be wiped out. And then Janelle Monet takes out the guy herself. And then there's like different bosses. And the final boss is the white woman. And the last thing that Janelle Monet says to the white woman who, who was part of this whole scheme is, and you call yourself a woman? And the idea of it was kind of like, I was watching, I'm like, what the hell does that mean? Like, what does being a woman have to do with subscribing to white supremacy? And it's, and so many of these like blabbity BuzzFeed blacks have this kind of idea that womanhood is this axis of identity that should create natural affinity with um, um, black people, including black women. And it's like, there were female slaveholders. There's that book, they were her property. I mean, like, they weren't like dragged along. They were active participants in the heist. You know, feminism is like Dave Chappelle says, they're complaining about their cut of the score. You know, like, I'm like in 2020, we're still like uh, acting like white women weren't active participants and beneficiaries of um, white supremacy. Like, why would you even put that? But that's what um, that's what this headline is like, right? All white, all male jury acquits Emmett Till's murderers and. What was diversity on that jury going to do? First off, like someone pointed out when I put this up on Twitter, Mississippi didn't have women on juries until 1968. So it would have been a given that it was going to be all male. You know, um, that's women weren't on juries like that, especially in uh, especially in the 50s, and especially not in Mississippi. But what's the implication here? Right. I mean, the idea that um, 1950s black people, uh, that's their concern. Like, they're being hung, lynched, abused for being black, but they're also splitting hairs about um, men versus women. Like, there's only two implications that can come from this uh, stupid headline. One, that the jury needed um, white women to balance out the white men. So this idea that women would have been more sympathetic and it's like a woman started this whole thing. I mean, do you think the white women in the town felt bad about this at all? This is their men doing it. Uh, the two women, the woman who accused Emmett Till, but also like um, her friend or maybe her sister was married to one of the other defendants, they were taking all the pictures. They were in that jury box. I mean, they were in the court smiling. They were as triumphant and celebratory as everyone else. Like, so I don't understand. I don't understand what a white woman would have made a difference or what a 1950s black person would have expected from a white woman, especially because that's these modern new blacks who kind of really especially think this way. You know, I feel like back then, I'm very skeptical that 1950s black people bought into this kind of ahistoricism and this kind of craziness, right? But then the next thing is, are they saying black women as opposed to black men? Like that the jury would have specifically needed black women. Black men wouldn't have been enough. And to me, that kind of reminds me of this new narrative about painting black men as Trump supporters, even though like 85% to 90% of them uh, voted against Trump, you know, but kind of create this idea that black men, these natural traders or these people who aspired to collaborate with white supremacy to the point that they'll sell. Um, I mean, is that what they're going for with this headline? Like this idea that black 
black men alone couldn't be trusted to make the right call in Emmett Till. It would specifically have to have been black women. Like to me, they would have just been happy to have black people on the jury and they would not have split hairs about the gender because what difference would have made? What difference would have been if it was a white woman on there? What difference would have made um, if it was a black man versus a black a black woman, you know? So, so I mean, this kind of what I'm talking about, like the dumbing down of of everything. Like, at least try. Like, you're freaking two Yale African American professors, and you're a bunch of like writers. If you're gonna have your agenda, just be slicker about it than this. Like, this is like laughable. Like, people were making jokes in my mentions. Some of them were so funny. Somebody put um this someone someone made the one fake headline handle right put cishet neurotypical white jury acquits like they might as well just put that in there just put cishet neurotypical white jury acquits while while they're at it you know it's like uh it's like very very laughable to me that um they can't even do their agenda slicker than this they're just putting this horrible um presentist blatantly um anachronistic headline headline in there it's like it's almost like parody if i put that in there as a parody i would have been, thought it was two one in those all white all male jury acquits you know i'm just thinking like of people in like the 50s just you know really upset about the patriarchal makeup of the Emmett Till uh jury you know weighing it equally with uh race but you know that that show has yeah someone put this someone said i thought about that title trying to protect white women but didn't think of it as trying to indict black men but yeah it's the same as the black trump thing like you can't trust black men to do the right thing right um but the show has a lot of moments like that. Like when Ruby's talking to Christina and says, like, you know, I don't know what's worse, being black or being a woman. And it was like, okay, in 1950s, freaking Chicago. Chicago, the place that um, Martin Luther King said was worse than any racism we face in the South. Like, it's it's so stupid. It's so stupid. Um, but that's what I'm talking about, how... In every role, the people are getting dumber. I'm like, like, and we're all feeding off of each other. We're all kind of getting complacent and stupid because we're all sparring with each other. It's kind of like someone shows up to training camp fat and enough people show up fat. Then are you really going to work to be in the best shape? Because now your competition's fat. Everyone's going to subconsciously let themselves go, you know? Uh, I was over Chanel when she said that um, the Popeye's, uh, why can't people show up to vote like they show up for the Popeye's chicken sandwich? And maybe we got to put Popeye's chicken sandwiches in the voting booth to get black people to vote. Like, get, get out of here. That told me all I needed to know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I was, I was over her with that. I mean, I never thought her music was that great anyway, you know, but. Like her lyrics are very vapid. So yeah, I was um I was over her with with that. Whew, what else? Yeah, so there's a lot of blaming of black men that is going on, but that's that's nothing new. I mean that's that's it is it is what it is, but it was just how um lazy it is that really was taking me aback about how, um, like, Brittany Cooper, Professor Crunk, came out trying to talk about um, black women need to do a sex a sex strike on black men to get them to uh, vote for Biden, and it happened uh, in in history before. It's not a new thing, and she did this like disingenuous site, and a real historian pulled up the site went to the primary sources and found out it was hearsay by some white racists, you know, saying that uh, black women had to do a uh, sex strike. Like, 
but a lot of people were like citing her and not even double checking the thing and stuff. And she's a tenured professor that gets um, called into all these different uh, cable news sites. And today was interviewed in uh, Washington Post about this stuff. And she's like a hack, you know, like how does she even get tenure? And and so many people, so many more people saw that horrible um, fake evidence than saw that guy's debunking it. And what I kind of realized the problem is that there's a paradox right now. And this is the paradox. Right now, um, being an influencer is the primary way to get big in any field. Like the academics, you have to be a good influencer and have an online following. To be a journalist, you have to be a good influencer and have an online following. Like that's... People have told me stories about, like, someone told me that the girlfriend went for a job as a journalist. She's a very good writer. And they asked her in the interview, yeah, what about your social media following? You don't really seem to have cultivated, like, a good one, you know? And they, because everyone's chasing the dollar and audiences. Everyone's fighting for audience eyeballs. And someone who looks like they already know how to self-promote you know, excites them because they think, A, you're going to bring your existing audience, and B, when we put you on a bigger platform, that hustling drive you do to self-promote, um, you're going to be able to make the most out of the platform we give you to grow even more exponentially. Um, someone told me the same thing about um, when they try to go for, a, get a book publishing contract, and the publisher... Um, as an author wanted her to have a more of a social media following and that they were hesitant to work with her uh, because of that. So this is what I kind of realize a conundrum is that is its own skill. That type of self SEO brand building, the type of savvy that it takes to get a hundred thousand follower count on Twitter and stuff like that. You don't get it just from being funny or clever. You have to be following trends, know how to word your tweets correctly, know how to twi uh, time them correctly, know how to kiss the right ass. I mean, it's its own skill. And I think that you actually can't. I call it the skills shills paradox. The skills shills paradox. You can't master shilling and still work on your craft with the level you need to get real skill you kind of have to choose am i gonna have to shill am i gonna have to work on the skills and some people a rare few can do both some people are very good at both some people are so skilled are so skilled that it's hard to ignore them and through skills and luck manage to get the same count and attention as a shill but if you had to choose between being a skill or a shill, if your goal is to make money, you're better off banking on being a shill. So what happens is you have a bunch of people who become the heads of departments in, in academia, uh, the top reporters, the top pundits, the top talking heads, because they're very good at being shills. And they all kind of scratch each other's backs, people getting screenplays off of it, doing all this stuff. You have that. But they can never really get good craft. And this stuff is always junk because they can't work on it. It's impossible. Or you have people like that person that debunked Brittany Cooper expertly. And I looked at his profile, and he's a real historian. He does real research. And he was very good at his craft. But, you know, he was basically said, yeah, I barely go on Twitter. But this was so outrageous. Someone sent it to me. I had to break my Twitter silence to go on and, and, and debunk this. And I'm like, he just says it all right there. He's too busy doing real teaching and research and stuff to um, be a shill. Oh, yeah, totally. Well, there's multiple reasons why it's so bad, right? I mean, it goes from the top, too. And I'll give an example. Uh, the old heads of studio, like say someone like Harry Cohen at Columbia, Daryl Zanuck at 20th Century Fox, all these old studio moguls, they may have 
come from different areas. Some of them were like sons of immigrants. Some of them were um, people who had different hustles. But when the movie industry came up, they hopped into the movie industry. Now, these people had real life experiences, first of all. They weren't just people who were trained to be managers and MBA programs and Ivy Leaguers and and businessmen they were like people who had real life experiences and a bunch of hustles before they went into being the head of a movie studio right and i said they from for the for the early musical movement these people they came from different things they had real life experience and real life insight and hard-earned wisdom and whatever now at the time what was 20th century fox it was just a movie studio. What is Fox now? Fox is something owned by Disney, which owns like theme parks, real estate, TV channels, um, movie studios, um, record labels, all this stuff. Same thing for the people who created the old music labels, like Electra Records um, or Def Jam was just a music label so that was it now it's part of uh island def jam which is owned by this which is owned by this so now like sony um like there's an at&t time warner you know might own a whole bunch of different things sony owns um tvs owns music owns books owns um so many different things now they own a movie studio they own um stores they own all types of stuff they have real estate you know so everything is a conglomerate you don't really have standalone companies for music for movies for whatever now they're just departments in a bigger giant conglomerate multimedia conglomerate so here's the difference a harry cone a daryl zanuck or whatever even if they didn't come up as creators, like they didn't work their way up from like, say, actor, writer, director, um, creator. But what they did is they created the industry and that was all they did. So if I'm Daryl Zanuck or Harry Cohn and I've owned a record, I mean, a movie company for God knows how long, you learn movies. You learn the you now you learn movies. You learn all of movies because you watch every moving part. So you may not know directing as good as a director. You may not know marketing as good as a marketer. But as the overseer of it all, you end up knowing the whole process. So you might know enough about directing to give input to a director, especially a new one, because you've overseen directors for like 30, 40 years. You can oversee the acting and they used to do that if you look at the making of movies in the old studio days the studio heads used to give very valuable input because they had to kind of develop an artistic eye to a degree and that was what comes with specialization that's what comes from experience now who's the kind of person who they're going to put in charge of a movie company or a record company right because first off it's not actually a company anymore it's only a department a subsidiary of a giant thing they're going to get a the head of the company now is really like someone like Kevin Suihara or some big exec or someone from like an MBA or marketing program or someone trained to be a businessman. He can't specialize in anything because he's just a business guy. He's a beans counter. He has to be someone that can oversee movies, music, electronics, products, theme parks. Um TV shows, news stations. So no one can know all that stuff. So all this person can do is just be a bean counter and then just try to look at everything in a bean counting kind of way, right? All they can do is just look at everything in a bean counting kind of way. They can't actually weigh in on movies. They don't know anything about movies. Um, He went to Wharton Business School. What does he know? Uh, and the, if you're noticing when these people go from industry to industry, they just jump from anywhere. Like, you know, 
this person who was a charge who was in charge of esports, you know, for uh, Mountain Dew has been hired as as the head of Marvel Comics. Uh, this person who was the head of um, the music department, you know, is made a lateral transition to the movie department. So that's what all these people can do. If you ever notice is just buy pre-existing properties, you know, or just do bidding wars. So it's like, um, Hey, what remake can we do? Can we, um, can we buy Lovecraft country? This thing seems to sell, you know, they don't actually have any understanding. And then they go and try to hire an outside expert to tell them what to do with it. So they're like, okay, black stuff is popular. You know, George Floyd, black lives matter. I'm not a movie guy. What do we get? Oh, this blue check. So what I'm saying is, this is what makes people extra susceptible to the shill. Someone's asking, why is most art entertainment so bad? Because the person on top doesn't understand the industry they're on top of. They're tasked with being on top of 20 industries. And because they're not part of the industry, like, for example, if Stan Lee or Jim Shooter, one of the old editor-in-chiefs of Marvel, was tasked with putting somebody to write and draw and do things, their decades of history in the field gives them an eye to understand this is a good writer, this is a good artist, um, et cetera. In the case of Stanley and Jim Shooter, because they used to write and draw comics and stuff, but even in the case of the studio heads who never actually physically acted or directed movies, they have seen enough people come and go in this industry that they could develop an eye. You know, like, uh, this is the best star I've seen since Ava Gardner 20 years ago. I got a good feeling about her. These people have no idea about this industry that they've been tasked with half the time. They're tasked with 10. The only thing they know is business and the commonality of business across the industries. So they don't even have the eye to pick a good expert. Because you kind of have to have a certain amount of expertise to even recognize an expert. You know, if someone said, hey, um, T, pick the best nuclear physicist out of this batch. I don't know anything about nuclear physics. You know, so what am I going to start doing? I'll say, well, this one went to Yale. Okay, I guess that's good. That's a good school, right? I would have to start, I would have to start looking at, um, circumstantial evidence i had to be like well this person has a lot of published articles and they seem to be popular maybe that's what it is like i couldn't look at their works and tell which one is a better piece of nuclear physics you know so then that's what i think creates the susceptibility to shills the people hiring multi-conglomerates and the people in charge don't know how to pick the best person so the person HBO is overseen by, like, AT&T, the old phone company, owns Time Warner now. Now it's called ATT Time Warner. Um, what the hell does AT&T know about uh, black art? Uh, what do the board of directors that they have to give quarterly reports to know about um, black art? And who on, the, who on the ground is most in touch with the black experience? Like. That makes them extra susceptible to climbers and people with a corporate mindset. These are corporate people. So the artist that knows how to move like a corporate drone is going to speak their language and connect with them better. And what is corporate stuff really about? To excel in corporations, these are the two strongest things you need. Anyone who's worked in a corporation will agree with me. Credentials and the ability to politic. Those are the two biggest things. If you're uncredentialed and brilliant and don't know how to politic, you're going to hit a dead end really fast. But because let me break down politicking. So credentials and politicking are the two biggest things to make in a corporation. What is politicking? Politicking is two things. Ingr no, three things. Ingratiating yourself to the right people was number one. Number two, taking credit. And number three, passing blame. If you can do those three things, ingratiate yourself to the right people, you know, kiss ass, uh, get in the right rooms, get noticed, get liked. 
take credit from the more talented people who aren't good at politicking, you know, because again, the skills shills thing, because of their skills, they tend to be bad at the shilling part. See, because you can steal skills by plagiarizing, by, um, you know, throwing people under the bus. It's hard to steal shilling. Um, so in these people's mindsets, it actually makes more sense to put all their effort in shilling. They can just um, steal someone's skills later and then blame their lack of skill on someone else. Yeah, so those two things. Um, credentials and politicking. And politicking consists of um, ingratiating yourself to the right people and getting in the right rooms, um, taking credit for smarter people and passing blame from people who are not as good as um, shilling as you. So they don't have any institutional support. They haven't built up any alliances or allies or whatever. They were too busy just trying to do their job. Yeah, see, everyone's talking about my beardlessness. Yeah, I'm becoming, I just spit extra hot game today because no one's going to trust a black man without facial hair. I got to really um come on. So, I mean, that's the answer to the question. So let's put it all together to answer that question. Why is the art entertainment so bad? Because A, the people at the top are just businessmen who have no actual experience climbing up in the field or if not climbing up in the field overseeing just that field so long that they become experts because those old studio heads even though they were technically suits they were very different they had a very strong artistic sensibility and the studios used to produce great work and i know like the stereotype is always this idea of the executive or the suits just being an option but those old studio heads used to make a lot of changes to stuff that actually improved stuff. They would sometimes help um, creators get out of their own way and make suggestions that, you know, the creators would say later, like directors would say, yeah, uh, Zanuck gave me a great idea and he was right, you know? Yeah. They also... Hold on. Someone asked a good question. Now I lost it. When I saw old AM forty five. Um. Yeah. Hold on. Where? Yeah. This is it. They also had a huge stake in the company succeeding, and that's the main thing because they were the head of the company. This company was their bread and butter. If it went down, they went down. If you're just like a CEO hired gun, you know, uh, and that happens a lot nowadays, you just jump from industry to industry. Um, you know, you're a trading card, you're a charge of a trading card company or trading card division this, this year, you're in charge of the comics division next year, you're in charge of whatever. And if it doesn't work out, you can just get a nice severance package and go to a whole different company. You know, that's something great, too. That Yeah, that's a great thing to put in there. So basically, you had a different type of person on the top. You had uh, they were ex they were not journeyman executives, but they were people who either worked their way up through the industry to get to the top or they were on top of the industry so long that they developed a creative instinct. And they also had something to lose if it didn't work out. And from there, the different type of person also uses people under the and the shill is much more rewarded than than the skills because and the mindset is different too because once you're corporate, you have a board of directors and stock reports and quarterly reports. Um, risk is very hard to do because you have to answer to your shareholders and your shareholders understand the industry even less. So 
even if you fail, if you fail in a low risk with a low risk program, your shareholders will forgive you more than if you fail with a high risk program. Because what you can say is this we released 20 Marvel superhero movies this year and nothing hit. People will be like, well, you failed, but if Marvel movies can't hit, something must be wrong with the industry. That's as low risk as you can get. You know, you can kind of fail upwards on a low risk situation a lot longer because to this Rube who knows even less about the industry than you do, they'll think, well, hey, if that doesn't work or Harry Potter movies didn't work, but if you try to do some really interesting uh, creative things that fail and then a quarterly report comes out, now like this um, bean counter hack can be like, why didn't you just do more of what works? Why didn't you just do more Star Wars movies? Why don't you do this and that? So, I mean, over a long enough timeline, failure catches up to you, but you can buy more time with low risk uh, stuff for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's uh, how to answer. Um, that's that's how to answer that question. Whew. Yeah, but um. Anyway, this extends to everything. This is how they pick talking head experts. This is how uh, Professor Crunk or the writers of Lovecraft Country get chosen. Because first of all, they're bouncing from field to field. But um, yeah, like uh, CNN's owned by how many different people? Like who really is going to take the time to figure out who on the ground the Negroes actually listen to or who actually has the voice of them? Um they don't know. They don't care. They just figure, hey, this woman's tenured. Uh, she got through her ten. She got her tenured by by using shilling over skilling, you know. But now all they see is that she's got the credentials and she's got the followers and all, a whole bunch of other blue checks who are also um, shills themselves seem to like her. Okay, uh, hire her. But that guy who debunked her, who worked so hard, who's a professor. He's not going to be able to get on the radar. You know what I mean? Yeah, so. This is another great thing, too. If everyone is doing the same thing, they don't leave themselves any chance of being embarrassed by an interesting small hit. But you know what happens? Even if an interesting small hit does happen, they'll just turn that into the next corporate thing. So, for example, Get Out was an interesting small hit. And instead of it creating like a shaking up of the industry where everyone else said, let's take our own risks, they just made get out into the new cliche thing to do. So now there's just a bunch of shitty black horror coming out. And who is in charge of the shitty black horror? The shills, the same blue check shills. They've just reduced it to the new version of the same shit that was coming before. Just a brain dead thing to do to just promote your own shitty politics and brand, you know? Um, yes, yeah, so I'm sure like Jerry o, J- Jeremy O'Harris is going to come out with his own black horror things too. Like everyone's going to gonna hop into it. So, um, yeah, um, BL said this, the writing isn't that hard to learn. It's the dealing with uh, people execs that don't know about the craft to get something done. Yeah, and that's exactly it. And those people who can chill better than you are going to get, um, and, and also because so many people in the audience are aspiring shills, they'll, um, pretend your stuff is good. There's a big chunk of the audience that likes, um, shills making it because, uh, when mediocrity wins, it inspires them more than when talent wins. Because if you're a shill, seeing talent win over shilling makes you feel bad because it reminds you that you can't, you know, maybe can't make it. But when you see mediocrity winning the day and being treated like skills, that is more inspiring to you because you might already know how to do that. So, yeah. Um, anything else? I don't want to talk too much more. Um, let's see what else is interesting. What's a good thing to end it on? But yeah, this whole ISQ, the 
we didn't even talk about blaming black men as much as I wanted, but maybe we'll um talk about it in a later live stream. Thinking about live streaming again later um night. But um yeah, you know what? I haven't done any um promoting for anything really except for but definitely if you enjoyed the stream, if you thought I um drop some good game by all means comment like subscribe and share share with people but also very important um hit the super chat if you're enjoying the stream uh that's always appreciated we split it up amongst ourselves and i want all the hosts to get uh, better equipment and all that good stuff so it all goes back into the show gets nice things like this in my case, um, better lighting, this mic, this shock mount, and all types, all types of cool stuff. Um, yeah, so definitely, definitely help us out with that. Help up, help out the other hosts and everything. And check out our shop. This is the address to our shop. But the easiest way is just go to redbubble.com and just look for... Um, Search T Bilzy, T B I L Z I E, and you'll see all a whole bunch of Champagne Sharks merchandise. There's three designs under every design. There's a bunch of um, there's a bunch of products. Um, like, comment, share, subscribe. I mean, there's no reason why we shouldn't have more likes. And also, uh, Patreon.com forward slash Champagne Sharks is really important. If you go here. Five dollars a month, the whole Sally Struthers thing, sixteen cents a day. You get uh, double the new episodes. You get access to like probably at this point, um, maybe two hundred um, premium episodes that are only available through there. Voice in Discord, Discord chat server. We're going to do a call-in show this week. I know I promised it, but we figured out the logistics. I'm going to do it. And only patrons will be able to do that who are part of the voice and discord chat server. So if you want to do the call and show stream, then definitely, um, definitely, definitely become a patron. If you're a patron, reach out to me at champagne sharks at gmail.com. If you can't get into the discord voice and chat server, we're, um, Resuming the newsletter, I didn't like MailChimp. I didn't like it. So I was looking for something else to do. And we found Substack. Substack works a lot better. So we're gonna resume, we're gonna resume the newsletter using Substack. So definitely look out for that. Uh, I'm actually working on it um, today. And also go to champagnesharks.com. Go to Sha. <laughs> For 16 cents a day, you can get a ring light for a hosting need. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and listen, if you can't become a patron, that's fine. You can always share. That's always, that's really important. Just always uh, share. Hey, I'm open to this idea. Email us at champagnesharks at gmail.com if you have ideas of ways we can appropriate blue check lingo to advertise our brand. You know, definitely uh, do that. And um, yeah, oh, so smash that like button, subscribe. I'm using all of Alex Marquez's tips. Smash that like button, subscribe, you know, hit the bell icon. That's all the stuff that I should have been saying at the top of the, the thing. Oh, the Sunday's book club is happening. Are you a Discord member? We're, we're four chapters in. Uh, every Friday we have book night and we're doing Settlers. Uh, every Saturday, we have movie night and we've done they they live uh soldier story lovecraft country episode five um network um and we have all the recordings of movie nights and book nights over at patreon.com forward slash champagne sharks but yeah it's going on so um definitely definitely um reach out to me if for some reason if for some reason uh you haven't been able to figure out how to work it but yeah reach out to us it's um uh, it's pretty good and um yeah i think that's i think that's everything um 
definitely support us all those ways and yeah so champagnesharks.com we just recently redid that and it has all the links except for the merchandise links which i'm going to put up uh soon all right cool so everyone be good thanks for joining us in the middle of your afternoon i know you could have been doing something else but actually i'll not i'll say something better but there's, there's nothing better than this there was nothing better you could have been doing i take it back you're in the right place all right take care y'all be good